This is VOA Africa. Good evening, I'm Esther Githui Yuat. It's Wednesday, January 8th. This is Africa 54. Al-Shabaab strikes again in Somalia. At least three people are killed in a Mogadishu bomb attack. Band musicians celebrate the new year and new freedom in Sudan. And we'll take a closer look at the coolest new gadgets on display at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. The Al-Shabaab terrorist group has struck again in Somalia. This time, the organization is claiming responsibility for a bomb blast in Mogadishu that a city spokesman says killed three people. Black smoke was seen rising across the Mogadishu skyline Wednesday morning as medical and security personnel rushed to the scene of the attack. The bombing hit Saidika Junction, a security checkpoint near the presidential palace, the interior ministry and parliament. Abdi Kadir Abdurrahman, head of the Armin Ambulance Service, told reporters that 11 people were wounded, including three women. The attack appears to be part of an intensified campaign over the past two weeks by Al-Shabaab in Somalia and neighboring Kenya, which have porous borders. Now to West Africa, where Liberians held a mass protest against the government of President George Weir that started peacefully but ended with tear gas, water cannons and arrests as police dispersed protesters who were planning a sit-in. Around 3,000 Liberians demonstrated in Monrovia Monday, calling on President Weir to fulfill the promise he made to the electorate during his bid for the top office. Weir, the former football star, grew up in a slum and was seen as a shining beacon who could usher in a new era. Instead, he's facing criticisms of corruption like his predecessor. He's also struggling to remedy Liberia's deepening economic crisis. Promised the Liberian people and did not fulfill the promise. Today he's afraid of the people in the protest against him. He protested against the past regime. Today he doesn't want to protest. I'm so disappointed in him. Tension in Liberia has remained high over the past year with multiple anti-government demonstrations. The U.S. Treasury Department on Wednesday slapped sanctions on Taban Dengai, the first vice president of South Sudan, for his involvement in serious human rights abuses. The Treasury Department says Deng has acted to divide and sow distrust within the Sudan People's Liberation Movement in opposition and the Nuer community. The Treasury says that has ended the conflict in South Sudan and harmed the reconciliation and peace process. Deng arranged and directed the disappearance and death of human rights lawyer Samuel Dong Luak and SPLM IO member Agri Idri, according to the Treasury Department. The U.S. President Donald Trump is giving a televised national address Wednesday after Iran fired more than a dozen ballistic missiles targeting two Iraqi air bases that house American troops. Trump's speech comes after Iran followed through with its promise to retaliate for the killing of its top military commander early Wednesday. VOA's Richard Green has the latest. The missiles lit up the night skies over the Al-Assad base, located about 60 kilometers west of Baghdad, as well as one in Erbil, part of Iraq's semi-autonomous Kurdish region. The attacks were carried out hours after the burial of Qassam Soleimani, the commander of Iran's elite Quds force, who was killed in a U.S. drone strike on Baghdad's airport on Friday. There was no immediate word of any casualties in the aftermath of the attacks on the Iraqi bases. Thomas Warwick, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council in Washington, D.C., tells VOA this may have been a deliberate decision on behalf of the Iranians. It appears as though the Iranians chose to respond with surface-to-surface -surface missiles in order to make a very precise point. They were trying to retaliate in a way that they controlled so that rather than doing it through one of their proxy militias, it would be in the hands of the IRGC commanders and the Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei. 
So it's clear they wanted to try to control what was done. Javad Zarif, Iran's foreign minister, tweeted that the attack on the two Iraqi bases were, quote, proportionate measures in self-defense and insisted that Tehran does not, quote, seek escalation or war, but will defend ourselves against any aggression. U.S. President Donald Trump tweeted hours later that an assessment of casualties and damage was taking place, but added the phrase, so far, so good. Trump plans to make a statement about the bombings Wednesday morning. Richard Green, VOA News, Washington. Millions of Zimbabweans continue to suffer and face hunger as the country experiences its worst economic crisis in a decade, marked by soaring inflation and shortages of fuel, medicines and electricity. The weather in the southern African nation is getting hotter and drier in recent years. Some farmers report they have ran out of food stocks and are forced to collect insects at night for family meals. This year's maize harvest was down 50 percent compared with 2018. Zimbabwe's overall cereal output is less than half of the national requirement. Last August, months earlier than anticipated, the World Food Program was forced to launch an emergency lean season assistance program to meet Zimbabwe's rising needs. Bread now costs 20 times what it cost just six months ago, while the price of maize had, has nearly tripled over the same period. 2019 has been an exceptionally tough year for all Zimbabweans. We see a factor or a combination of factors, economic uh, downturn, climate change and subsequent droughts that have led more than 8 million people into food insecurity. As in WFP, we're looking at ramping up our response over the next couple of weeks to reach almost double of what we have planned. Years of drought have slashed food production in Zimbabwe, once known as the breadbasket of Southern Africa. Now, for decades, U.S. universities have attracted large numbers of foreign students. But lately, international students seem less enthusiastic about the United States. VOA's Kathleen Strzok and Bronwyn Benito take a look at the factors prompting a growing number of foreign students to look elsewhere. Shrushti Sinha knows exactly why she chose to come to college in the U.S. The freedom that you get here in terms of choosing what you want to study and also the opportunities that studying here gives you. We have prime ministers and presidents come and speak at Columbia during the World Leaders Forum. You get to attend talks with Nobel laureates. But that's not the only draw for prospective international students. The U.S. course offers a more vibrant discussion. There is more peer-to-peer -peer discussion going on in the class, whereas in the UK is more lecturing all the time. More than one million international university students study in the United States today. But is enthusiasm for an American education waning? We've seen in the last two years shifts in where students want to go. Some foreign students balk at the price of a U.S. college or university, which averages between $25,000 a year at state schools and as much as $70,000 a year at private universities. And cost isn't the only hurdle. Obtaining a U.S. student visa can also be a challenge. I met a lot of parents who wanted to send their kids earlier, but were like, oh, no, you know, with the visa situation, with, you know, the climate against immigrants and whatnot, we are unsure, and, they, and that was a huge factor in them deciding against it. I think the number one struggle with this visa situation is not having stability, security. I think it's the uncertainty that uh, really affects how a lot of students view America as an education destination now. That uncertainty is heightened by America's often harsh political debate over immigration, as well as U.S. policies targeting travelers from certain countries. The appearance of being unwelcome, the strong anti-immigrant rhetoric that unfortunately is dominating our political environment, those sorts of sentiments can be misread internationally as negative feelings towards international students and scholars. Meanwhile, violence in the U.S., including mass shootings at American schools and crimes against foreigners, are trumpeted in headlines around the globe. The end result is a leveling off of international student enrollment in the U.S. According to the annual survey by the Institute for International Education, the U.S. is still the number one choice for foreign students. But countries like Canada, Australia, and New Zealand are gaining popularity. We know that international students also have 
more cho choices than ever before about where to pursue higher education. Despite the hefty price tag and other factors that make the U.S. less attractive, the draw for international students remains strong. Being here opened the, the doors of the world to me. The people I meet, the opportunities I get access to, I think the United States uh, really gives you some of the best of that in the sense that it's not just American, it's also global. Opportunity changes everything. U.S. universities that depend on foreign student revenue hope that sense of opportunity endures. Bronwyn Benito, VOA News, Washington. Sudanese musicians who were banned by ousted President Omar al-Bashir's government have returned to the country to play in a series of concerts in a move seen as symbolic of the changes that are taking place in the country. Naba Muhyiddin has more from Khartoum. The Sudanese hip-hop group Nas Jota returned to Sudan for a New Year's Eve concert, their first show at home since 2004, when authorities banned their music for being political. Nas Jota, which means chaotic people in Arabic, was forced to flee after former President Omar al-Bashir's government cracked down on artists who called for protest and new leadership. But since Bashir's ouster last April, Sudan's transitional government has welcomed back dissident artists like Nas Jota. This is the moment that we're looking for, is that finally I can come back to my country, make life events for my people with no fear. Before, I couldn't. The musicians are hailing their return with charity concerts, marking Sudan Independence Day, January the 1st, the New Year, and a new Sudan, along with one concert for children with cancer. Some of the artists, like hip-hop singer Ayman Mao, have been living in the United States and hope to see similar freedoms in Sudan. In 2020, I wish for the youth in Sudan to have a freedom of expression, freedom of uh, justice, equal rights, especially the artists. Um, I want them to have a Sudan where they can uh, be creative and uh, uh, ex uh, express themselves. Returning artists like singer Rasha Sheikh Adin admit there is still a struggle in Sudan. I'm so excited. Uh, the country feels new. Although it's still difficult for everybody, uh, prices are really high, high, life is difficult. But people are happy and hopeful and full of plans for the future. It's fantastic. <laughs> Many of the protesters of the December 2018 uprising against skyrocketing consumer prices that led to Bashir's downfall say they listened to the bad music during the month-long popular uprising. These songs have inspired the youth and encouraged us because they describe what was happening. It gave a motivation and a power to the youth. The concerts continue through mid-January to support relatives of those killed during the crackdown on protesters as well as peace across Sudan. Neba Muhyiddin for VUA News, Khartoum. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, cutting-edge innovation at the annual Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. You're watching Africa 54, and we'll be right back. about women's issues, it's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation. Aye, aye, 
hi, you just hi, hi, hi. Nina uka ni luka guseli, na jingwe uka pena ni malaria. You my own man. I don't wanna waste no time. I say, all oh, love, all oh, love, my mama. You know I'm wanting you. I say, all oh, love, all oh, love, my mama. Can I be the one for you? Tell me, where did you come from? <laughs> It's time for our technology segment and joining us now is our tech reporter Paul Ndiho with the latest on the big tech show in Las Vegas. Hello Paul. Hello Esther, how are you? Uh, thanks. Uh, the, the 2020 Consumer Electronic Arts Show is underway in Las Vegas. People are flocking there to see the latest technologies, uh, robotics, uh, drones, artificial intelligence, virtual reality and uh, how things and how things that we use every day are changing. Thanks to the technology, VOA's Michelle Quinn has more. Las Vegas, known for gambling and lights, turns into entirely something else this week, the epicenter of the technology industry. More than 4,000 exhibitors and 170,000 attendees, many from around the world, are here to get their hands on new technology. Everybody's really looking at technology to help connect themselves better, right? And so every company is realizing that they have to use technology to better um, future-proof their companies. More than one-third of visitors to CES are from outside of the United States, drawn to Las Vegas to be part of what the future will hold. One of them is Pierre Rounet, who comes to CES from France to show off his robot, Ricci. It plays the game tic-tac-toe with humans and shows sadness when the game is over. And to us, CES is really a great opportunity to have a lot of buzz, a lot of uh, communication around the Ricci and to show what he can really do. Some unexpected companies are at CES to make a splash. This is the first CES for Charmin, the toilet paper brand, which came to Las Vegas as part of Procter & Gamble's technology display. Today, it's a robot that delivers toilet paper rolls. Again, you're on the commode, you look over, no toilet paper, nobody there to help. What do you do? You pull out your smartphone, you fire it up using Bluetooth, and here comes the Charmin robot. It delivers a fresh roll of Charmin to you, saves the day. There are smart ovens, smart pet doors, smart showers, and more than one smart toothbrush. This one uses radio frequency to clean teeth. CES is an innovation exhibition, and this is the very innovative. In the dental industry, there are not many innovative products. Uh, when, when we talk about toothbrushes, basically they're more of the same for many, many years now. But this, is, this takes brushing to a next level. Of course, many innovators are working on new things, such as smart glasses that come with eye tracking technology. When I look at you, I can ask the glass to, to, to give me your name. What's your, what's your name? What's his name? Uh, for example. Or brainwave readers, which is something of a new trend this year. This one comes with an app to help a person meditate. Each year, the Consumer Electronics Show is a reminder that even if you think you've seen it all, technology is always changing, even for cute robots. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, Las Vegas. For more on the latest innovations and technology being showcased at the Consumer Electronics Show, let's go live to Las Vegas, where VOA's Azuma Kampaore is standing by. Hello, Azuma. What's up, man? Hi, Paul. How are you doing? I'm well. I'm well. Thank you. What's, uh, what's trending over there? So as you know, CES is the epicenter of innovation, and uh, this week we are getting a heavy dose of artificial intelligence, 
being built into product and uh, services, autonomous vehicles and uh, future of mobility, the smart industry, 5G, easily the biggest trend at CES. And of course, uh, we have all the innovation happening in mobile uh, from 5G to foldable screen devices, new camera capabilities. There is a lot of reason to be excited about what's happening in the industry right now. As some have said, we are at the cusp of the innovation cycle and it has impact across all products. You take, for example, audio. Uh, today, artificial intelligence is clearly leading uh, the development of smart speakers. Uh, looking back at uh, 2019, analysts uh, say that the holiday season was just uh, a big hit with an overall growth of 4.6%. TV market was actually uh, a big hit as well. Mm. 50-inch uh, and above TV sold about 3 million in just three weeks. Wow, interesting. What are some of the uh, African uh, tech companies that are present there? And how, how are they playing compared to the tech companies here? So, well, uh, the African startups number at the CES almost quadrupled. Teams from Senegal, Morocco, Egypt, and Tunisia brought to the table a diverse uh, range of products, from artificial intelligence to augmented reality and financial tools designed to improve farmers' productivity. African innovators clearly uh, are placing themselves uh, at the center of the global tech scene. Uh, who, are, who are the leading uh, tech companies uh, from Africa? So right now we have a big team from uh, Morocco that is here with about uh, 11 startups. So they are coming with, uh, you know, a set of uh, knowledge and tools ranging, like I said, from artificial intelligence uh, to augmented reality and, uh, you know, very leading on, you know, cutting edge technology. Uh, Senegal and uh, Egypt as well are here with a lot of uh, interesting, uh, you know, uh, capabilities, but overall, this, those startups that are here from Africa are here to prove themselves and to, to be exposed to the world, to the bigger scene. Well, but, Azuma... Uh, what I wanted to, uh, to stress, too, is that uh, what I'm very excited about is uh, this year there's the launch of the Global Tech Challenge. It's a partnership between uh, CES and the, the World Bank. Group well, that will Azuma, thank you so much. You're breaking up. Uh, so thank you. Okay. Thanks, right. Azuma. VOA's Azuma Compower reporting live from Las Vegas. U.S. best technology companies are looking to train software developers, engineers, and build an ecosystem in Africa. Perhaps more importantly, they want to hire talent directly from the continent. Bob Mwiti, a Kenyan tech guru and a co-founder of Apps Tech America, an IT consulting company based in Tampa, Florida, is trying to change the way tech firms hire professionals from Africa. He's trying to train and help African immigrants with IT and tech backgrounds to secure good paying jobs. Bob, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you so much for having me, Paul. Uh, oh, to bring us up to speed, uh, what's uh, Takes Up America about? Uh, well, uh, we are an IT consulting company. Basically what we do is uh, we train mostly African immigrants uh, to get those job-specific tech skills. Okay, and then also we help out with uh, placement services for those who want to get out there in the tech industry and get good jobs in the tech industry. And then also we also help out those who are back in Africa and they want to come here and, uh, you know, do master's programs in the tech industry. And then also once they graduate, we are able to help them out with, uh, you know, any job placement that they may need when they, once they get here in the U.S. What does it take? How do you get into the tech uh, industry? Uh, well, uh, to get to the tech industry, you have to choose a specific tech skill that you want to get into. Like, for example, personally, I have an accounting background and, uh, you know, I didn't know much about technology until actually I got in. So you have to know exactly what skill that you want to get into and then now you can focus on that skill and that's how you can run with it. Uh, when we were talking, you talked about uh, robotics. You are into robotics. So maybe talk more a little bit about that. Yes, uh, so robotics process automation is one of the technologies that my company, we train people on. I personally worked as a robotics process automation analyst. And basically, this is a technology that leverages the power of artificial intelligence. And uh, what happens is uh, most companies out there, they have processes that are very tedious, repetitive in nature. And what companies are now doing is replacing those uh, kind of uh, processes which are done manually by people and being replaced now by 
robots, and these are software robots. These are not, you know, your industrial robots. These are software robots. And uh, we train people on that kind of a technology where you can actually go out there and do an implementation for that kind of a project. And uh, we have a training program for robotics process automation on a UiPath tool. And this is on uh, on you becoming a business analyst. Uh, 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 Bob, uh, you talked about uh, how you are actually helping a lot of uh, Kenyans uh, with uh, uh, tech and IT backgrounds to come to America. Yes. Uh, how is that uh, going and uh, how many uh, people have you helped so far? Uh, well, we have this program that we launched last year where we are bringing, we call it the Kenya Airlift Program. We are basically focusing on bringing those brilliant Kenyans who want to come here in the U.S. and get into the tech industry because there's a lot of opportunities here in the tech industry. And basically what we do is we source for their funding here in the U.S. in terms of uh, graduate, uh, scholar graduate assistantship uh, scholarships. And also uh, on top of that, also we, we get them uh, unsecured international student loans. And then now uh, once they are here, in the US and once they start now going to school we are also able to provide them online with job specific skills where now once they graduate from college they have those skills that are needed on the job market so that they can be able to take all the opportunities that are here and get good jobs now for that program we started it last year we have about 30 people uh, who are already in the program they are you know for you to get here as a student, you have also to, there's a lot of things that goes on. You have to prepare, there's some exams that you have to do. So we have most of them doing that, those preparations. And we already have three students who are already here in the US as students. And we have many others that are also getting in and now trying to get into the program. Uh, Baba, very briefly, uh, for a kid watching you anywhere in Africa or in Kenya, what is it that they need to do? How do they get into this uh, tech uh, business? Uh, well, uh, you see, a lot of people, there's that misconception about technology or IT. A lot of people think that IT, it's all about coding and programming. Personally, I don't know how to code at all. Okay, I used to work in the industry as a systems analyst, basically implementing from the front end. I don't have to do any coding. So, so anyone out there back in Africa and they want to get into the tech industry, don't, don't be scared because, you know, there's a lot in the industry. You know, IT is very, very broad. You can just focus on one specific skill and you don't have to know how to program because, like I said, personally, I have an accounting background. And, you know, you can just focus on that and, you know, uh, train on that. There's a lot of training out there online uh, and you just get trained and then you can just go there and do the job very, uh, very well. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. I look forward to hosting you another time. Thanks, Bob, for coming to Africa 54. Bob Mwite is the co-founder of Tech America. Thank you so much. That's our report. Uh, back to you, Esther. Paul, that was a great report. Thank you. And be sure to join Paul and Dio each Wednesday for another tech segment on Africa 54. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, have a good evening.